morning and welcome back. Yeah. Yeah, so nice. To, someone said when, I, when they were coming up, I said, so nice to see you. And they said, well, you're not seeing all of us. And I said, well, I guess that's true. I miss seeing the rest of you. But uh, I promised them that I wouldn't shower them this morning, just the flowers. Uh, so I'll stand back. Uh, to keep my distance from you guys up here, but it is a great delight to see you here this morning. Uh, thank you for uh, coming out, for deciding that to gather or regather as people of God is a priority in your life. Uh, I hope that you can say with the psalmist that you were glad to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, and, and obviously, we were able to worship individually in our homes over the past 11 weeks, but there is something unique. And it is ordained in Scripture for the people of God to gather together uh, to hear the Word, to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, to teach one another, admonish one another through those, to pray together, to read Scripture together, to share the Lord's Supper together. We're not doing that today, but, but we will soon. And as we continue to go out with the hope of Jesus Christ to baptize others into the faith. So, we're grateful that you're here today. Um, first thing I want you to do, I know you probably don't normally hear this in the church, is to take out your cell phone. Go ahead and take it out. It's okay. This is the one time you say, wow, he's letting me take out my phone. Take out your cell phone. I want to give you a couple of uh, announcements about some exciting new features that we have. Um, if you are our guest this morning, you, first of all, are very welcome here. I see some faces that I'm not familiar with, even under the mask. Uh, I see some faces I'm not familiar with. We are delighted that you're here. Thank you for choosing to come and worship with us today. We would love for you to text the word WELCOME. Just text the word WELCOME to 803-590-1975. Once you do that, you'll get a text message back that will ask for some contact information. We won't stalk you or sell your information to a third-party retailer. But we would like to know a little bit more about you and ways that we can connect with you in the future. If you have a specific prayer request, you can text the word prayer to guess what? 803-590-1975. And once this is done, you'll get a message back. You fill out the contact information. Let us know how we can pray for you. And you can be confident that your prayer request will be taken uh, before the Father uh, throughout the week. If you're watching our service today uh, via Facebook Live, we'd enjoy getting to know you as well. All you have to do is text the word hello to 803, I'll say with me, 590-1975. Once you hit send, you'll get a text message that will ask for your contact information just so that we can stay in touch. Finally, anyone who would like to get text updates, uh, whether it's just what's going on in the life of the church, this afternoon around 12, you'll get a text message that will have some application questions if you're in the loop. If you want to be in the loop with us here at East U Baptist Church, all you have to do is text the word loop. That's L-O-O-P. Text the word loop to 803-590-1975. So we'll have your information there, and you'll be able to get in, uh, updates throughout the week. That's all I have about phones, so I'll put mine away. For those of you who are involved in our Sunday School ministry, uh, your weekly study guide is available on the back table on the right as you're going out today. Be sure to notice that there is a difference between the leader guides and the learner guides. Leader guides are typically bigger. The learner guides are a little bit shorter. And so please uh, pick those up as you go out and use those as tools uh, as you spend time in the Word. Parents, your child or student Sunday school material is on the table on the left. As you go out the doors today, you'll see it on the left-hand side. Jacob, will you hit the slide? One, advance one slide. There we go. So this month, we don't have a bulletin yet. All right, that is in the works. We'll have an online bulletin that you can just look at your phone. For those of you who are curious, so see, you'll get to use your phone again in church. Um, <laughs> or your tablet or whatever i device you have uh, but just so you know these are a couple of folks that have birthdays this month and some anniversaries coming up we'll uh, put those in the bulletin once we get that but we just wanted you to see uh, the gift of life that was given to these individuals in the month of march i mean march 
We haven't been here since March. I'm still stuck on March 22nd. Um, and June anniversaries, congratulations to those folks as well. Praise God for the gift of marriage uh, and, and the, the foundation that, it, that that is to, to society. Uh, the next slide, uh, all, if you don't mind, we're going to spend some time in prayer uh, as the people of God. And, well, yeah, let's just pray. Because I, I don't need to say anything else. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, when the people gathered together, you have promised that there would be a presence. It would be unmistakable to those who live close to you and your word. You are the bread of heaven. You are the living water. You are the light of the world. We've seen that in the text over the past few weeks. These declarations make it clear that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is God. Father, we confess that we are often a people who question your provision just like the Israelites did in the wilderness. We ponder why you would allow us to experience what we've experienced. Questioning the goodness means we're questioning your character, which means we're placing ourselves above you as if we know better than you. Forgive us, O oh God, please. Father, our nation is struggling with the destructive effects of sin. Many have rejected your offer of true justice and have sought to assume they know better about how to bring about lasting change. We know the gospel is the only hope for eternal reconciliation. And so help us to live like gospel-minded people. Recognize that we are meant to be peacemakers. We're meant to stand up for justice because you are just. Please comfort the Floyd family today. Give them and many others wisdom to use their hurt and radical injustice to point people to the liberator from the bondage that sin claims on humanity. Many are hurting, Father. They're crying out for some sort of attention, making demands known. And we know, God, the ultimate hope is found only in you. We ask you to please bring peace to the people of Minneapolis and other major cities where violence seems to reign. We turn away from and refuse to participate in skepticism, criticism, and cynicism in our nation. We turn away from anything that divides us and we run toward the gospel of Jesus Christ because he's the only one who has the power to unite us together. Fathers, we now gather, please revive our hearts to carry out our biblically mandated mission to genuinely love and care for one another. You've assembled this group of people for such a time as this for today. So, may the Church of Eastview, Father, remember your authority. May we love your law. May we have the strength and the desire to resist temptation. As we study the scripture, may we see your word as truth, the only truth that offers real and lasting freedom. It's in the powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray. And the people of God said with one voice together, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I can't read it. I wasn't sure I was going to be able to read it on the back wall back here. But let's all stand as we read the scripture this morning. Go with it. What then are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one. Either of 
of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and have been set free from sin, having become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin, and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and is in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise God. Praise God. This morning we're going uh, to try something a little different. We're going to do a medley this morning, and it's going to be a cappella. So I need all of you to sing out loud. Okay, but all of you know, I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. Okay, let's, let's start. I come to the garden
with the way we've gotten to be a part of your journey. Uh, and God bless you uh, in your work there at North Greenville. Henry, would you stand? Yes, Henry, he's taller than I am, even on the stage. We are so blessed to see you grow and become the man that you have become. Uh, obviously, you've been here, most of you have been here longer than I have. Uh, but for the time that I've been here to watch each of you, uh, just in my two years here, become the, the man and the women that you have become, we celebrate with you. Uh, Henry's headed to Furman. And excited about that opportunity for you, Henry, and cannot wait to see what God does in you and through you. Uh, we certainly know of your leadership skills that you've demonstrated around here, around our community, in your school. And we just can't wait to see how God uses those leadership skills uh, to continue to make the gospel known on the campus of Furman. Uh, so congratulations, Henry. I want to pray over those students, but before I do, there are two other students. Uh, they're not here today, uh, but we also we want to recognize uh, the accomplishments of two of our uh, graduate school students. Caitlin Alton completed her master's degree in occupational therapy. Uh, and she's looking forward to some field work this summer. She's going to be taking the national board exam later this year. And Abigail Penza completed her bachelor of arts degree in public health at USC's Arnold School of Public Health, and she did it in three years. Uh, so in 2021, she will be attending the University of West Florida for her master's degree in public health. So uh, we celebrate those two accomplishments as well. Would you join me in prayer? Uh, church families, we pray over these young people excited for what God's going to do uh, in their lives. Father, as we recognize these students I thank you for the work that you are doing in their lives to prepare them for this new adventure. The time has come. The training that their parents and the church family have poured into them now has an opportunity to take flight and, and, and grow their own roots. And put down the hope of the gospel where they're traveling to. Their dorm rooms, their apartments, classrooms, the gym, the fields. Father, may they not forget the foundation that has been laid for them in Jesus Christ. And as they go, may they carry the light of Jesus Christ onto those campuses to make Him known above all else. Father, I pray that we have had a part in helping to shape their worldview so that when they are confronted with a worldview that's diametrically opposed to the biblical one, they would know how to stand up for truth. I pray that they would not be afraid to speak up in a woke generation where safetyism is the key term of the day. I pray that they would recognize that they are going into uh, schools where they will be deemed harmful if they bring the message of Jesus Christ. They would be labeled as dangerous. Father, your word is not safe. It's beautiful. And it's a work of reconciliation that offers freedom, true freedom. And so it's going to take courage in the lives of these young people. For Henry, for Hannah, for Mackenzie, it's going to take courage. Do not fear, as we read from your word. Be courageous. I pray they be courageous. Father, for those of us who are here, for their parents, give them continual reminders of how they can be lifting their student up. And may these students not disconnect from their parents, but see their parents as a great gift from you to continue to help shape and guide them into the days ahead. For the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Y'all come see me afterward. Uh, Henry and Hannah McKenzie will have those gifts for you. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn with me to John chapter 8, please.
I said in the protocols that we put out that we would try to limit the service to 45 to 50 minutes. I am doing my best to accomplish that. Um, I want to honor the fact that you're out there masked up, and I'm not. Uh, and so, and I want to try to keep our word to what we said. So, uh, John chapter 8, we'll get there in the reading in just a moment. Uh, we ended our passage last week as... Jesus dropped another hard teaching on the people. He was making claims that he was the light of the world, inferring that he was the one leading the people through the wilderness wanderings, that it was his glory that filled Solomon's temple, and that he was the fulfillment of their great Feast of Booths celebration. Those claims further alienated the Pharisees as Jesus warned them that they were in danger of experiencing the fires of hell because they were from below and he was from above and the two don't mix at all. But when the Son of Man is lifted up, Jesus said, they would know that he is, I am. As he was saying these things, Scripture tells us in John chapter 8, verse 30, that many people believed in him. But what kind of belief was it? Friends, not all professions of faith are genuine. Remember back in John chapter 6, when Jesus spoke about one's natural inability to come to the Father apart from his leading them to him. Many disciples who had walked with Jesus for the creature comforts and the miraculous healings turned around and walked with him no more. They were believers in the sense that they liked what this traveling rabbi had to say when it was to their benefit. But they did not possess genuine saving <laughs> faith. Even today, there are many who would say, I went to an evangelistic meeting one day and I raised my hand to receive Christ and I repeated some words after the preacher and I've sat in the same pew every Sunday at 11 a.m. That makes me a Christian, right? How would you answer that question? If the faith they professed isn't the faith they truly possess, then it does not offer the hope of eternal life. So in our text this morning, Jesus basically turns his attention to this new group of individuals who have expressed some interest in following him. So let's look. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. I'm going to read the whole text today, just so that we can get the whole picture of it in one reading. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We're all spring of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. How is it you say we'll become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly. Remember when he says that, pay attention. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you're offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. I love that text. Go back and look at that. I don't have time to unpack it. Just that verse. They answered him, Abraham's our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you'd be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who's told you the truth that I heard from God. That's not what Abraham did. You're doing the works your father did. They said to him, we're not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you'd love me, for I came from God, and I'm here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he is speaking out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you don't believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. 
The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. May those who have ears to hear, hear the words of the Lord. Let's call this Discipleship 101 today. As we're praying and asking God about the possibility of hiring an associate pastor of discipleship and missions, we have laid out for us right here what's required of a true disciple. One who has genuine faith, which is not only saving faith, but also continually sanctifying and sustaining faith, as we will see. So the first thing we need to pay attention to is the fact that a true disciple must abide in God's word. True disciples abide in God's word. As one abides, we could say we find rest or shelter or comfort, as we might experience in the comfort of our home. In a similar way, we are to abide or remain in God's word because there we'll find rest and shelter and comfort. When we believe in Christ, we give up the rights to live our own lives and instead become his disciples. And his one major rule in his theological training school is that his disciples would continue, abide, prevail in his word. While children are sent to school for a set number of years. Our seniors can testify to seeing the light at the end of those years. But true believers are bound to Christ for eternity, not just a set period of time. Abiding then means to continue to hold on to the teachings of Christ and not let go. That the Word of God would so fill us that we can barely contain it, allowing the Bible to dominate every area of our lives, every thought, every word, every action brought into conformity of the Scriptures, even when we don't like a particular teaching. Ever been there? Gotten in God's Word and you're like, ooh, I don't like that. Even those moments, we obey and we ask the Father to help us better understand that teaching and warm our hearts to a proper response. Friends, abiding in God's Word is critical to staying spiritually healthy and useful for kingdom service. Because if we neglect to abide, our souls will face spiritual rot just as a building deteriorates because of lack of proper care and maintenance. Abiding is taking a long-term perspective on things. It's taking the small sips of that coffee drink and cherishing every drop instead of downing that espresso shot in one cup and leaving unsatisfied. The Christian life is not lived in the instantaneous, but in the eternal. It's not the fire insurance that some were promised as a youth at their camp meeting. Rather, it is eternity spent in relationship with Christ the Father instead of eternity separated from any relationship and apart from Christ and living in eternal torment. God has set eternity in our hearts. Ecclesiastes 3.11. And so eternity doesn't just mean in the by and by after we die. It's right now. In Christ. We're already living in our eternal relationship with the Father. Abiding in Him. Following Jesus for a day is easy. It's easy. But holding on to Jesus for a lifetime is difficult. But it's the way of a genuine disciple. Matthew 7, 14 says, For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Many come to Christ thinking it's the cruise ship to heaven. I've said that analogy before. People don't want to be on cruise ships anymore, I guess. But, but there was a day when you wanted to be on the cruise ship to heaven. And you could eat the eternal midnight buffet. They're not having those anymore once the cruise ships come back, I heard too. But anyway, many people thought, come to Christ thinking that's what a relationship with Christ is going to mean. And then when something gets hard, it's like, oh, never mind. This is what I thought it was. Abiding in God's word means we begin to see more clearly what the scripture means. By man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Deuteronomy 8.3 when that was first written, the
The Israelites were being reminded of their wilderness wanderings. How God tested them. And He even used hunger to test them. He even fed them some what is it? That's what He fed them. Some what is it? Manna. But it was what is it? He fed them some what is it to teach them that while well, bread is good. Yes it is. I can testify. Bread is good. But God's Word is even better. The very words of God can satisfy one's spiritual hunger in an even greater way. You know how much fun it is to have God out there today? <laughs> Just say that. I'm going to go over time, aren't I? But I'm going to watch my time. It's good. It's good and right to get to see your faces, not the lens of a camera and the, and the time. Not just to see my face, but so that y'all can see one another's face. So that, well, half your face. <laughs> so that you can teach, admonish, and encourage one another in these things. Abiding in God's Word means we should constantly find ourselves rethinking things. Not being afraid to have our thinking challenged. Because it's in that challenge that God is stretching and growing us. Hannah, Henry, and Mackenzie, your, your, your minds are going to be stretched like laughing taffy. You know. and, the, and the hope is, is that it doesn't get let go and pop right back like that and you come back going, ouch, my head. My, my, what's going to happen as you're stretched at school is what we should be doing in the Word, allowing it to stretch us. And yes, there are some things in here that we're not going to understand. So we go to the Father and we say, Father, help us understand. But often our trouble is we don't want the Bible to change us. We want to change the Bible so that it will affirm what we already think or believe. Friends, if we've already mastered the Bible to the point that our thinking is never going to be challenged, then we don't need the Bible. But that won't ever happen. And so we must remain in constant contact with the Word of God. God told Joshua, the Scriptures must be meditated on day and night. Jesus then wasn't introducing something new to His audience. He was teaching them to hold fast to God's Word, prevail in God's Word, because it contained the very words of life. Words that increase our knowledge of God, leading to greater understanding and worship. So as we abide, we will know the truth. The second thing we need to look at today. True disciples will discover the truth in God's Word. Truth is being attacked today. Six years ago, New Age guru Deepak Chopra tweeted, quote, all belief is a cover-up for insecurity. In other words, there's no object objective truth. Instead, you just replace truth with personal experiences. That kind of thinking, that kind of nonsense has crept into the church too. Where you're supposed to go to church and experience some new spiritual experience. Letting go of biblical objective revelation for some sort of mystical experience. That's not what God's Word teaches. We reject emotionalism and sensationalism as being God's Word to us. Instead, relying solely on the Word of God which makes much of Jesus Christ and not about my experience. The Bible simply is the Word of God, maintaining its meaning and truthfulness irrespective of you or me. Truth defined is that which corresponds to reality. That's how you define truth, that which corresponds to reality. The statement that Jesus is Lord of all creation is either true or false, whether it's spoken flippantly under one's breath or with great devotion. It has only one truth value. It's either true or it's false. It honors reality or it honors the stuff of make-believe fairy tale land. Aristotle began his great work, Metaphysics, with the statement, quote, man by nature desires to know. Douglas Grodice in his book Truth Decay said, truth is a daunting, difficult thing. It is also the greatest thing in the world. We seek it and we fear it. Our better side wants to pursue truth wherever it leads. Our darker side balks when the truth begins to lead us anywhere we do not want to go. Truth matters right here, right now. We want to know the truth about the origins of COVID-19. We want to know the truth about treatments and vaccines and whether wearing masks and distancing ourselves socially really matters. We want to know the truth about the reopening of schools and what that's going to look like in the fall. We want to know the truth about deep hurts and injustices that are fueling nationwide protests. 
We want all people to know the truth that our Creator God made every shade of skin beautiful because every human is made in His image. There's no room for discrimination of any kind at the cross. So let's not allow the devious rioters in cities nationwide who have evil, selfish intent to cause us to neglect the real hurt experienced by the Floyd family, the Arbery family, the Taylor family, and countless others who've been subjected to hate because of the color of their skin. So we ask the Father, as did Martin Luther King Jr., that we be children of light who are not satisfied with the world as we have found it, but look to God for wisdom on how to be people of truth as we wait for the new earth in which righteousness dwells. We expect our favorite news channel to tell us the truth. Walter Cronkite used to end his CBS news program by saying, anybody know? And that's the way it is. Meaning that he was presenting truth to the audience. We trust our local, state, national leaders that are leading us in truth. You support my family emotionally, physically, and financially out of an understanding that I will study, prepare, and present to you truth with the understanding that it isn't my truth that I proclaim. It's truth because I communicate the Word of God, which is truth. Truth about our nature, our God, and the way of salvation. For John... Truth isn't an idea or some sort of philosophy. Truth is a person. That person is Jesus Christ. Knowing Jesus means we can know freedom. Third thing that true disciples capture from the Word. True disciples experience freedom in Christ. We're familiar with the word freedom. We celebrate it a lot around Memorial Day, Independence Day, those kind of days. We, we know what we're talking about. We say it in our Pledge of Allegiance. We talk about being free from quarantine or free from the weight of school. The supposed believers in our text this morning took offense at Jesus' mention of freedom, claiming they were Abraham's offspring and they'd never been enslaved to anyone. Now they need a history lesson, don't they? They've been enslaved plenty of times. We won't go there today. But the freedom Jesus is talking about here is on a much larger scale. He's talking about freedom from sin. To recognize Jesus as truth that offers freedom, we must acknowledge that we're all enslaved to sin. And Nelson Mandela's autobiography, Cry Freedom, after he was released from prison for 27 years, talks about the day he left prison. And he says, as I finally walked through those gates to enter a car on the other side, I felt, even at the age of 71, that my life was beginning anew. My 10,000 days of imprisonment were at last over. Friends, our slavery to sin means that one day we would be kicked out of the house, but the sun remains forever. Look at verse 35. The slave doesn't remain in the house forever, but the sun remains forever. So we need the sun we need Jesus to set us free forever. Jesus wants to say to you and me, I can show you the way out of prison. You may say, oh Chris, I live in a comfortable house. I drive a decent car. I enjoy memory making vacations to the campground. I'm off to spread my wings in college. I'm not in prison, Chris. Please hear me say that if you don't know Jesus, you're in prison. You are bound today to your sin and your guilt. And right now, at this very moment, Jesus is saying, I have the key and I can open the prison doors and I can truly set you free to know real freedom. John Owen says we should know the answers to two questions if we're going to somebody for help. Number one, is that person willing to help us? And number two, is that person able to help us? Is Jesus willing and able to help us? Yes! Yes, He is! As we abide in God's Word, discovering truth, we will find freedom. Not freedom as if we can throw off all societal constraints and do whatever we want. That's not freedom. That's slavery to our passions and our lusts. True freedom that offers us the opportunity then to say no to the fleeting pleasures of our flesh and hold out for the hope that is the fulfilling joy that comes in Jesus Christ. Freedom to know Christ more. Opening up new ways to delight in His presence. So if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Now the path to that kind of freedom means you have to learn God's Word by abiding. We have to obey it. Here's an equation for all you students. Learning plus obedience equals freedom. Learning plus obedience equals freedom. 
Many Christians today don't know spiritual freedom because they're not biblically obedient. If you're a believer but you still feel like you're in spiritual bondage, maybe it's because you're not obeying the Word of God. So tragically in our text, these professing believers thought they were doing fine spiritually, but they were deceived. They weren't abiding. They had no intention of recognizing their sin nature. And so Jesus offers some indictments that are warnings for us as well. The first indictment is that the people were relying on family lineage to justify their standing before God. The famous theologian Jonathan Edwards, he married Sarah Pierpont 